is what they call themselves and what they prefer to be called. Iroquois is actually a French mispronunciation of an Algonquian pejorative term meaning sneaky or snake-like. So you can imagine that the Haudenosaunee people don't want to be called Iroquois. Don't be saying Iroquois. <laughs> now you know. Now my family joined in this commemoration because it was the only way that we could feel honest about this dreaded anniversary. We were not going to be the folks going to Columbus Day parades, which is a bigger thing back east. And we weren't going to be raising our daughters to let them know that the history was about the land being discovered and then made useful by the white Europeans. So we sat solemnly with other European Americans and the Haudenosaunee people as we reflected on what happened so long ago that still affects us today. I remember feeling that 500 years earlier, other mothers were right there at Ganondagan, stirring their children awake, probably starting to prepare some breakfast, innocently starting the day, unaware of the great cataclysmic changes that were about to happen. My heart, my heart went out to those people. And I wish that I could totally undo all that harm. But alas, the only thing I could do that day was to be fully present in solidarity with the Native American community. And now, all these years later, I continue my own ritual of remembrance by celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day tomorrow, not Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day. It's an occasion that I mark by sharing what I've learned in the hopes of raising awareness and making some small but meaningful steps toward right relations, toward healing these great wrongs. Now my own journey of understanding absolutely continues as I gain insights from intentionally learning more about the original peoples of this hemisphere and their experiences after European contact. One of my great learnings came when I attended our Unitarian Universalist General Assembly in Phoenix, where I was asked as a delegate to vote on our denomination's repudiation of the doctrine of discovery. I must admit, I thought to myself, what the heck are they talking about? What is this doctrine of discovery? Why am I being asked to repudiate it? So I'm just wondering, how many of you have heard of the doctrine of discovery? A few of you. OK. So we're all going to learn together this morning. As I made my own discoveries about this doctrine, I was simply shocked, shocked and amazed at the history, but also the present day continuing impact of this religiously based tool of conquest. The doctrine of discovery is a principle of international law dating from the late 15th century. Its roots are in a papal decree that the Pope specifically sanctioned and promoted. He was promoting the conquest, the colonization, and the exploitation of the non-Christian territories and the people living there. Hundreds of years of decisions and laws continuing right until this very moment can ultimately be traced back to this doctrine of discovery. Laws that invalidate and ignore the rights, the sovereignty, and the humanity of indigenous peoples in the United States and around the world. Our General Assembly voted to repudiate this doctrine, so I want to share a bit more about it with you. For it's only in honestly looking at our history and seeing its consequences that we can begin to be in right relations with the indigenous peoples, not only here in our own hemisphere, 
but those folks in Africa, Asia, Australia, and in New Zealand. So let's begin at the beginning. Now, as you know, the Catholic Church has been po a politically powerful force for centuries, often intertwining their power with that of the state. Often popes were called upon to create pronouncements that would justify political means, political actions. These proclamations were often known as papal bulls. Weird name, I know, but that's what they were called, papal bulls. On June 18, 1452, Pope Nicholas V issued the papal bull called in Latin, Dom Tiberius, which authorized Alfonso V of Portugal to reduce to perpetual slavery any Saracens, which meant Muslims, so any Muslims and pagans and any other unbelievers. This papal bull facilitated the Portuguese slave trade from West Africa. The same pope wrote the bull called Romanus Pontifex on January 5th, 1455. And it was for the same Alfonso V of Portugal. It was a follow-up to the first one, and it extended to Catholic nations of Europe dominion over all discovered lands in the age of discovery. Pretty amazing. Just saying, I decree it. So along with sanctifying the seizure of non-Christian lands and seas, it encouraged the enslavement of non-native, non-Christian peoples in both Africa and the New World. After Columbus came home from his travels on behalf of Spain, Pope Alexander VI issued another papal bull called Intercatera in 1493, stating that one Christian nation did not have the right to establish dominion over lands previously dominated by another Christian nation, thus establishing the law of nations and the flag planting business. Yeah, that was the I claim this land for Queen Isabella thing. Yeah, that got started by the Pope. If you could claim it, it was yours. Together, these three papal bulls came to serve as the basis and the justification for the global slave trade of the 15th and 16th centuries and the wholesale invasion of other continents, plundering its people and its resources. Fundamentally, it was the doctrine of domination, of Christian superiority or supremacy. And it said in its interpretation that indigenous peoples didn't have souls. Therefore, they weren't fully human. Therefore, they should be enslaved, even if they convert to Christianity. Unfortunately, unfortunately, these concepts, now known collectively as the doctrine of discovery, found ways to continue to justify exploitation and oppression of indigenous peoples and their land for centuries afterwards. Our own nation's policies in dealing with Indians and our belief in manifest destiny are rooted in this doctrine, asserting that by the will of God, the white man would take possession of the land from the Atlantic to the Pacific and from Alaska down to Argentina. The doctrine of discovery is also a concept of public international law expounded by the United States Supreme Court. They actually quote this in the Supreme Court proceedings in a series of decisions, initially in one called Johnson versus McIntosh in 1823. So think of this. Our United States Supreme Court quoting papal documents from the 1400s. Yeah. 
The doctrine that was set out by the court was Chief Justice Marshall's explanation of the way in which colonial powers laid claim to newly discovered lands in the age of discovery. Under it, title to newly discovered lands here in the U.S. lay with the government whose subjects discovered the new territory. The doctrine was primarily used to support decisions that invalidated or ignored aboriginal possession of land in favor of colonial or post-colonial governments. In other words, it said, if we discover it, think Lewis and Clark, it's ours. It's ours. Now you might be tempted to think, well, all this impact was in the past. But the shocking part of it is that many of our laws today ultimately look to this doctrine to justify it. The doctrine was actually quoted in, um, in as recently as 2005 in a decision with, from the city of Sherrill versus the Oneida Nation in New York State. So this is like real stuff. This is not theoretical. But importantly, it's not just about the legal parts of this. Those legal parts are just one aspect of it. But because there was the belief in these things. It's the stories that we tell about ourselves and others about the way the world works that has kept this, this doctrine and its poisonous effect alive in our country. This doctrine has insidiously justified our understanding that it's okay not only to take the Indian land, but it's okay to dump nuclear waste there. Or it's okay to go in and drill for oil gas, uranium. It's okay to scoop up Indian children and put them in residential schools. It's okay to steal their culture by misappropriating their ceremonies. It's okay to look the other way and leave the Native Americans impoverished. We can't underestimate the power of this story being told over and over and over again for over five hundred years. If that story says that white European people are superior to indigenous people and had the right to take their land, it's easier to treat people who are not Americans badly. If our story about our nation does not take into account how the native people felt or were treated, it's easier to brush off the humanity that we think doesn't belong here, meaning immigrants, meaning refugees, meaning Muslims. And so at Phoenix, at Phoenix, back at that General Assembly, I joined the vast majority of delegates there in adopting a resolution to officially repudiate the doctrine of discovery and to work toward, to commit to working toward healing. Since um, that time, our faith has been joined in a growing movement to repudiate it um, because it's done so much harm. Now, listen to this list of other folks who have gotten on board. The Episcopal Church, the World Council of Churches, the United Church of Christ, the Society of Friends, which is also known as Quakers, the Moravian Church, the United Methodist Church, some of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America synods, and the United Nations, all of them calling for repudiation. Now, it, while it may seem like, well, heck, the damage is done, it's also true that it's never, never too late to right a wrong. Indigenous peoples all over the world are calling for the reversal of the doctrine of discovery because they've all been hurt by it and they all still suffer its effects. Now, maybe it's not possible to return all the land to the native people, but it is possible to accept responsibility in our time for the unfairness and to see what can be done for healing. So other than studying and becoming aware of things like the doctrine's impact, there are some very real and tangible ways that we can work to undo its harm. 
and to begin this healing process that's way long overdue. We've got some ways we can do this, this very moment. The Reverend Peter Morales, who's currently serving as the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, issued this statement in late August regarding the protests at the Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota. This is what Peter Morales said. The construction of the massive Dakota Access Pipeline stretching from North Dakota to Illinois is a textbook case of marginalizing minority communities in the drive to increase fossil fuel supplies. As people of faith and conscience committed to protecting the interdependent web of all life and supporting indigenous rights, Unitarian Universalists cannot remain silent as land sacred by our Native American siblings is threatened. We join other faith groups and Native tribes to support the Standing Rock Sioux tribe as they oppose the construction of this dangerous pipeline. I am proud to see that Unitarian Universalists in the region are already joining the protests, but I know that more is urgently needed. I urge you to join the effort to bear witness to the injustice in North Dakota and add your voice to oppose the Dakota Access Pipeline. Words from the person leading our denomination. So this morning as we're gathered here, there are Unitarian Universalists at the Sacred Stone Camp in North Dakota, lending their presence and their witness. This morning as we're here, some of the other congregations out across the country are mobilizing to send material aid to these water protectors, especially as winter sets in. We, Unitarian Universalists, are doing the work of healing by acting in solidarity with the Standing Rock Sioux tribe in their struggle to protect their land, their water, and their sacred burial grounds. We begin healing by showing up. And you may be wondering how you personally may want to be showing up in support of these folks. Chalice Gustavson will be sharing a wonderful presentation with you all with some very specific suggested actions and more details about the Dakota Pipeline situation. And she's going to be doing that at noon in the library. So if it works in your schedule, I strongly suggest that you join her there to learn more. But we also have another opportunity right here in Utah to support the coalition of Native American nations who want to protect the Bears Ears region from fossil fuel extraction, inappropriate, disrespectful recreational use, and the looting of artifacts that threatens their land and its cultural and spiritual meaning. This area, as you noted from the, the videos from the tri this co tribal coalition, this land is sacred to these folks. And they are asking, they're asking, unprecedented, they're asking the federal government to protect the land through the establishment of a national monument. Now I'm aware that this is a huge controversy here in Utah, especially in the southern part of our state. But I urge you to educate yourself and take action to support the wishes of the people who have lived in this area for centuries upon centuries. You can simply go online and look at Bears Ears, protectbearsears.org, you will learn a lot. It is said that you, once you become aware of patterns of injustice, you begin to see them everywhere. When we take a really honest look at our history with this doctrine of discovery and the lived reality of people unjustly affected, we begin to grow our own hearts. We are cracked open with more compassion and more understanding. 
this deep truth does have consequences. But we can make choices, however small, to turn the tide toward justice for all the indigenous peoples on our planet, all of them. Our faith may be small in numbers, but big in its conscience, and in its will to stand on the side of love to right the wrongs that have been centuries in the making. We each have a part in making that happen. You can do your part. So I urge you, be curious. Be curious and compassionate as we continue to learn and as we commit some of our personal resources to help those who are still oppressed by this ancient story of domination. May we rise to the challenge of healing healing this very deep wound, simply because our indigenous neighbors are counting on us. May it be so. Blessed be.